treatment of divers with dysbaric illnesses or decompression illness. The use of pressure in the treatment of dysbaric illnesses is truly one of the unique components of diving medicine. And in the process, Divers Alert Network is one of the important allies because it specializes specifically in being a hotline and to offer assistance for the treatment and support of injured divers. Now in this presentation, the chief aims are going to be to show you how recompression is able to provide bubble compression, inert gas elimination, and oxygen dosing. Now depending on the circumstances, recompression regimens can be selected to have either a greater or a lesser impact in a particular area related to either bubble compression or inert gas elimination. And that's part of the art of recompression because we need to select an appropriate combination based on the most important facet of an evolving pathophysiological process. In other words, at the time the divers treated, what is the most important priority in order to provide relief of the underlying problem at that time? Since 1879, when pressure was first used by Ernest Moyer in treatment of tunnel workers building the Hudson Tunnel in New York, uh, many of whom died, he actually proclaimed rather cynically that he believed that the treatment he offered, which was air compression, was homeopathic. In other words, he was treating people in the way in which the disease had actually originated. Nevertheless, he was able to drop the mortality rate significantly and subsequently it was understood that slowing decompression had the benefit of allowing people to avoid bubble-related complications. But it was only in 1930 that Alfred Benke, a captain in the United States Navy, started including the use of oxygen in the treatment of decompression illness. Until that time, oxygen, and certainly in compressed cylinders, was relatively rare, and it was largely due to the technological advances propagated by the First World War, subsequent developments, and in preparation uh, for the Second World War, that many of the advances in technology occurred that subsequently would make it possible to treat divers in a recompression environment using compressed oxygen. Nevertheless, it was only after the work of Workman and Goodman in 1965 that oxygen and pressure were combined as a routine for the treatment of bubble-related disorders, which is relatively recent. Then in 1968, Professor Fructus, with a French commercial diving group, introduced the use of helium and oxygen, which became a requirement due to the greater depth of diving that was taking place in the commercial diving arena in the oil drilling industry. It was no longer possible to curb the symptoms of bubbles that occurred at greater depths with a combination of pure oxygen, three atmospheres. Then the final paradigm that emerged in Hawaii by Lee was the combination of oxygen, helium and pressure to afford a combination of greater pressure, less gas density, less inert gas narcosis whilst maintaining optimal oxygen delivery. Nevertheless, in spite of all these developments, the most common table in use today is called the United States Navy Treatment Table 6, which is 18 meters for approximately 4 hours and 45 minutes. The first 75 minutes are at 18 meters, in which there are three oxygen breathing period of 20 minutes each, interrupted by five minutes breathing air, followed by a 30 minute decompression from 60 feet or 18 meters to 30 feet or 9 meters. The remainder of the table is completed there, and it might either be in chunks of 15 minutes air break, one hour oxygen, twice followed by a slide to the surface, or in the modification introduced by the United States Air Force under the influence of Jefferson Davis, periods again of 5 minutes air breaks, 20 minutes oxygen, for a total period which is the same as the original 2 hours and 30 minutes at 9 meters. The table may be extended as we'll show you soon, but this has become the core treatment of gas bubble disease throughout the world although there are certain changes, modifications 
and extensions that may be applied, this table is the workhorse in gas bubble disease and for many represents the first and primary treatment of decompression illness. In providing recompression therapy, there are essentially three considerations. They are the mechanisms involved in the recompression therapeutic process, they are the selection of tables from which one might choose, and then finally there are the various treatment decisions that may be made during a course of recompression therapy based on the diver's response to the treatment. The mechanisms of recompression are relatively self-evident. There is bubble compression, redissolving of inert gas, the addition of oxygen, the counter-diffusion or exchange of oxygen for inert gas, but then there is also the resolution of edema, the absorption of swelling, as well as the treatment of the consequences of the temporary blockage caused by bubbles by using oxygen under pressure. The recompression tables, on the other hand, are essentially combinations of increased ambient pressure, oxygen and time, and they're largely based on experience and empirical concepts, in other words, theoretical extrapolations from the principles of science and diving medicine into practice. The observations have followed, but in many cases there are relatively few animal or comparative studies, meaning studies comparing the outcomes associated with one particular treatment regimen and another. In making the therapeutic choices when treating a diver under pressure, there are treatment pressure ranges between 1.9 and 6 atmospheres, so essentially 9 meters to 50 meters breathing either air or, in certain cases, oxygen or mixtures of oxygen and nitrogen or oxygen and helium. The treatment gas is adjusted because oxygen becomes too toxic and therefore other mixtures are required in order to allow greater depths or greater pressures of treatment. Within these decisions, the oxygen percentage and thereby the partial pressure may be chosen deliberately for operational safety or therapeutic reasons. The inert gas or so-called diluent gas may also be selected based on operational safety or breathing resistance considerations and are typically either nitrogen or helium. Hydrogen has actually been used in certain cases, but this is relatively rare because it is a potentially very combustible mixture. Then there's the decision whether a longer single treatment or more repetitive treatments should be provided. And finally, there are the additional measures of hydration and medication that can be added and may also add to the therapeutic effect of the overall treatment plan. The fundamentals of surface-based recompression, in other words, where the diver leaves from the surface, typically one atmosphere unless it's at altitude, and after a period of diving returns back to the surface, in other words not a habitat or a saturation environment, under these conditions a rapid onset of symptoms in which there has been no delay prior to recompression, pressure is the priority. The reason for this is that bubbles are the offending agent and compressing their volume as quickly as possible into the smallest possible diameter is the single greatest therapeutic agent. However, as time moves on or if symptoms develop more slowly and there has been a delay prior to recompression, then the secondary problems related to the bubbles, the swelling, the tissue disruption, the oxygen starvation become increasingly relevant. In many cases the bubbles may even have disappeared and therefore the therapy is largely related to the oxygen delivery that may be enhanced once it is provided under conditions of increased ambient pressure. So then oxygen becomes a greater priority. There's the principle that when in doubt about what the cause of symptoms might be and they are compatible with decompression illness based both on their presentation and the type of dive profile, recompression is considered to be an important priority. In general, further decisions on how a table should be completed or how 
recompression should be undertaken are made after a period of 20 minutes at 18 meters or 60 feet. In other words, a diver that is presumed to have decompression illness is compressed to 18 meters and after 20 minutes stock is taken as to whether the diver is improving, remains static or may be deteriorating. Having said that, before considering treating anyone at pressures greater than three atmospheres, we encourage you to consult an expert in diving medicine because the implications on both the operational aspects, safety aspects and ultimate recompression uh, flow charts and algorithms changes significantly as soon as a pressure of 18 meters is exceeded. The therapeutic allies in the process of recompressing a diver include pressure, oxygen, fluids, but also time. To use the analogy of someone who's shot, upon admission to the emergency department, they might undergo rapid stabilization and emergency surgery for the removal of the bullet, but no one would expect for the person to remain under those conditions of therapy and vigilance for as long as it would take for the entire bullet wound to heal. In a similar way, recompression may assist in removing the so-called bullet or bubble. However, the resolution of the damage the bubble has caused is not going to occur solely as a function of recompression, but may also require time. And therefore, ongoing recompression or repetitive recompression would only be continued up to the point where there is no significant improvement from treatment to treatment, thereby suggesting that the bullet is still in place. This is an important consideration. Otherwise, over-treatment, with its cost but also operational and safety implications, may ultimately tip against risk-benefit considerations. Let's now consider the most popular recompression table in use today throughout the world. It's called US Navy Treatment Table 6 or Royal Navy Table 62. It comes from the work of Workman and Goodman, published in 1965, and in its simple form may be 4 hours and 45 minutes, but can be extended both at 18 meters and at 9 meters to constitute a total length of 8 hours and 10 minutes. Now this may seem long, but some of the original older tables were as long as 48 and even 72 hours. So 8 hours and 10 minutes is really relatively short. The table starts out at 18 meters, or 2.8 atmospheres, breathing oxygen, and then has a second stage at 9 meters, after which the person returns to the surface. Its primary indication is for neurological decompression illness or musculoskeletal decompression illness that does not respond promptly within 10 minutes at 2.8 atmospheres. In other words, purely joint pain related decompression illness of relatively short latency and onset, in other words, something that has developed quickly and is treated promptly that has not subsided within 10 minutes at 18 meters would be considered to be deserving of this table and it is therefore only the ultra short lasting and ultra responsive forms of pain only decompression illness in which a shorter table than this would be considered. Most consider this to be the minimum treatment for decompression illness. You've seen this table before it starts at 18 meters. There are three oxygen breathing periods of 20 minutes interrupted by five minutes breathing air. And these may be extended by an additional two sessions of 20 minutes oxygen, five minutes air. There's a period of five minutes prior to the decompression over half an hour from 18 meters to nine meters. The reason for the five minute air break prior to decompression is because oxygen seizures are unlikely to occur beyond a period of five minutes that an individual has been off oxygen. In other words, if a person has been breathing oxygen under pressure and the oxygen breathing has been suspended for five minutes, 
it has been found to be very unlikely for a diver to then still suffer an oxygen-related seizure or convulsion. This then provides an additional measure of safety prior to commencing the ascent from 18 meters to 9 meters. Once at 9 meters, an air break of 15 minutes is provided, followed by an hour on oxygen, 15 minutes on air, another one hour on oxygen, which may be extended twice. In other words, two additional sequences of 15 minutes air, 60 minutes oxygen. Now the United States Air Force has provided a modification breaking the 1560 into 5 and 20 for three periods. When extensions are provided, however, one should remember that the extensions should be in multiples of the original 15 minutes air and 60 minutes oxygen, which would therefore translate into three periods of 5 minutes air and 20 minutes oxygen if the Air Force modification is used. The reason for this introduction by Jefferson Davis was as a result of a pulmonary oxygen toxicity case that developed when a diver with serious neurological decompression illness ultimately developed significant pulmonary oxygen toxicity and it was found that this modification provided some additional benefit. When the long oxygen table is used under different conditions, in other words at altitude, it is necessary to consider the attendant. The attendant who enters the chamber with the diver for the most part is breathing air and therefore is doing a dive at altitude to 18 meters. It is therefore very likely if the treatment has occurred at altitude or if the table is extended beyond its original form that the attendant will need to breathe oxygen as part of their own decompression schedule. And therefore once one arrives at 9 meters the needs of the attendant should be considered. The maximum single oxygen dose is two back-to-back -back US Navy treatment table sixes. From the oxygen toxicity lecture you might recall that this constitutes a total of approximately 1,400 units of toxicity. A table that is designed to basically be two back-to-back -back US Navy treatment table sixes was developed by Carl Huggins at Twin Harbors in Catalina off the west coast of America and is called the Catalina Table. This is one of the tables from the US Navy manual that shows how the tender oxygen decompression requirements may be determined based on the altitude at which recompression is provided with or without additional extensions. It indicates how many minutes the attendant needs to breathe oxygen once the chamber is decompressed to a pressure of 9 meters or 1.9 atmospheres. Attendants are not to breathe oxygen at 2.8 atmospheres due to the increased risk of oxygen toxicity, especially if they are busy tending a patient. A modification of US Navy Treatment Table 6 has been called the Air Embolism Table. Expanding on the work of Workman and Goodman in 1965, Charles Waite, a US Navy diving medical officer, eventually came up with this particular table which allowed submariners, in other words submarine escape training victims who had developed arterial gas embolism to be treated at 50 meters or 6 atmospheres for a brief period of time after which they would continue on a regular table 6. The reason for the choice of compressing them to six atmospheres was largely political. The reason being that at that stage, the only acceptable treatment for air embolism was compression to 50 meters. As Charles Waite himself admitted, this was largely to allow the Navy to accept the table and allow the diving medical officers to have a shorter period inside the recompression chamber because the results were essentially the same as most of the bubble compression could well be achieved within the first couple of minutes at 50 meters, the extension of the table that previously could easily run into 36 to 48 hours seemed to be nonsensical 
and the combination of a short exposure to 50 meters followed by a long enough treatment at 18 and 9 meters to avoid the additional uptake of inert gas at 50 meters to cause problems for the attendant allowed the treatment of arterial gas embolism to be shortened significantly. However, there are important caveats and those are that this table is really only appropriate for surgical or traumatic related arterial gas embolism treated within six hours meaning whilst the bubbles are still likely to be lodged in the cerebral circulation and it is not appropriate if a diver has accumulated significant loads of inert gas and then develops cerebral arterial gas embolism possibly even by venous gas bubbles ending up in the arterial system. In these cases, treating a diver at 50 meters may accumulate critical amounts of inert gas and actually lead to an exacerbation or a deterioration of their condition when they are rapidly decompressed from 50 meters to 18 meters. For the most part, a US Navy Treatment Table 6 is considered appropriate for most operational cases of arterial gas embolism. This is what the table looks like and one can see for a period of 30 minutes there is a short spike on air to 165 feet or 6 atmospheres, 50 meters, and during this period the objective is to compress all remaining bubbles in the cerebral circulation after which with a relatively rapid ascent from 50 meters to 18 meters a regular US Navy treatment table 6 is resumed. The short oxygen table has very limited application. It's also called US Navy treatment table 5 and Royal Navy treatment table 61 and is also based on the work of Workman and Goodman. The table is 2 hours and 15 minutes in length starts at 18 meters, has a session at 9 meters, and then decompresses to the surface. Sometimes this table would seem to be a very attractive option if a diver arrives in the middle of the night. However, there is a concern that this table represents an undertreatment, and it is very common for divers to have a relapse, often a serious one, when undertreated using this table. Therefore, its only recommended application is in situations of omitted decompression, in other words where a diver has violated their diving tables but have not developed symptoms of decompression illness at that time and therefore this table is used as a precautionary measure to prevent the onset of symptoms. It is sometimes acceptable when mild joint pain of rapid onset and rapidly treated in the recompression chamber remits completely within 10 minutes or a rash remits completely within 10 minutes at 18 meters. Lastly, it might be considered to be the minimum treatment for a doubtful case of decompression illness in which lack of response after 20 minutes at 18 meters leads the diving medical officer to the conclusion that the diver does not suffer from decompression illness and thus it offers a shorter opportunity for a diver to be taken out of the recompression environment in order to receive alternative treatment. It could thus be called an oops bailout. Not completing a short oxygen table in doubtful cases of decompression illness might result in a rapid decompression precipitating decompression illness that otherwise would not have occurred. So this would be considered the very minimum treatment of a doubtful case. Otherwise, in all other cases of decompression related illness, US Navy Treatment Table 6 is considered the minimum. This is what the table looks like. It starts at 18 meters for 20 minutes as an air break, a following 20 minute period, where after the original table by the Navy started with a decompression from 18 meters to 9 meters. Based on the so-called risk of oxygen off related seizures, the Air Force conservatively added a 5 minute air break prior to the ascent from 18 meters to 9 meters after the second oxygen breathing period. This table is not extended. 
if extensions are required, one essentially is completing a US Navy Treatment Table 6. There are conditions under which breathing mixtures other than oxygen may be required. One example is represented by the so-called COMEX 30 table. COMEX is a commercial gas company in France that developed a table using oxygen and helium due to North Sea diving related decompression illness and involves recompression to four atmospheres or 30 meters in which the diver either breathes 50-50 heliox in other words 50% helium, 50% oxygen or in certain cases 50-50 nitrox. It is sometimes used in remote recompression facilities that are more specialized to treat severe forms of decompression illness, particularly those affecting the vestibular system or when they are the result of trimix or mixtures including helium. It is a specialized treatment and is not recommended unless the facility is truly specialized, experienced and the case is deserving of this additional complex treatment. The original COMEX table involved different stages of decompression from 30 meters, but for simplicity's sake, the ultimate version that is commonly adopted throughout the world is essentially a two-stage compression starting at 30 meters and then 24 meters, after which a conventional US Navy treatment table 6 is completed. Another table that may be of value because it illustrates a principle in treating divers at 18 meters is the so-called saturation table or US Navy treatment table 7. It could be considered the so-called heroic table, holding pattern or slow bailout. And the reason for this is that if a diver at 18 meters is breathing air, they are essentially breathing a PO2 of 0.59 or close to 0.5 atmospheres which basically means they can maintain that level of oxygen partial pressure indefinitely. Put differently, it means that when you put a diver at 18 meters on oxygen, they are breathing the highest safe partial pressure of oxygen for therapy of dysbaric disease or decompression illness. When removing the oxygen breathing apparatus, they are still breathing the highest partial pressure of oxygen that they can safely breathe indefinitely. And therefore, this pressure can actually be maintained virtually indefinitely. The use of this table is therefore indicated when a diver is treated at 18 meters and has symptoms or manifestations of decompression illness that made it make or symptoms and manifestations of decompression illness that make it obvious that decompression at that stage would either result in permanent disability or death or where the diver has not seemed to respond to recompression and one has to be assured that no further recovery is possible. Therefore, this represents the slowest possible way in removing a diver from a recompression environment when there is actually no expectation of recovery. It is thus a slow bailout. This is what the table looks like. It represents an initial 12 hour minimum period at 18 meters which essentially allows the symptoms and manifestations of decompression illness to stabilize without any changes in ambient pressure after which the slowest possible rate of decompression to the surface is then maintained. This table would typically commence after a diver has exhausted all the extensions on a long oxygen table at 18 meters and therefore already be close to three hours where after a minimum period of 12 hours breathing chamber air would commence so that means one would be already at something like 16 hours after which an additional 36 hours of decompression would be required in the chamber. One is essentially going to stay in the chamber for two days and therefore this is not to be undertaken in chambers that are not able to sustain basic logistics not only for the sake of the injured diver who is critically ill,
but also the attendants that would need to maintain basic biological functions including eating, drinking and eliminating waste. Another table that needs mentioning is US Navy Treatment Table 4 or Royal Navy 64. This is essentially a damage control table. By that we mean that if a diver has, for whatever reason, been treated at 50 meters and the period of 30 minutes in table 6A or the period it took to stabilize the dive at 50 meters has exceeded 30 minutes, this represents the shortest possible escape from 50 meters. Therefore, if someone was brave or foolish enough to treat a diver at 680A or 50 meters, this is the fastest way in which the diver may be returned to the surface. Currently, its only indications would be a diver that is obviously deteriorating as a result of bubbles after being treated for 20 minutes at 18 meters, as might be a situation of a deep or saturation or trimix dive at an extreme depth in which there is truly the possibility of further gas bubble development or bubble persistence after treatment at 18 meters for 20 minutes. Those situations are rare. Alternatively, this table may apply if someone has either complicated arterial gas embolism or where arterial gas embolism has developed in a diver that has significant nitrogen loads. In its original form, the table did not include oxygen breathing periods and using the table without oxygen actually managed to bend the attendance, which means that this table is borderline therapeutic and is largely a way of providing compression with a slow decompression at the threshold of the onset of symptoms. Oxygen breathing period is therefore of the utmost importance not only for the patient but also for the tender and the manual should be consulted to determine exactly how this should be done. The last combination which was previously demonstrated by Lee involves a table in which one commences compression to 18 meters for 20 minutes the diver does not stabilize, continues to deteriorate, in which case one switches to a table uh, COMEX 30 at 100 feet or 30 meters. And after an initial period of 20 minutes at that pressure, if the diver continues deteriorating, the option is then to switch to a U.S. Navy treatment table 4 at 50 meters, 6 atmospheres or 165 feet. At that point, the diver would then follow the table 4 and failing recovery at 18 meters may either continue with a saturation decompression or may complete a US Navy treatment table 6 if there has been appropriate recovery. Again, this is a sort of table that should not be undertaken unless you have experienced staff and a highly specialized treatment facility. A table that is not an initial treatment table for decompression illness is what is called the standard hyperbaric oxygen treatment table. In other words, this is the treatment in hyperbaric chambers that may be provided for conditions that are not decompression related, such as wounds and other medical conditions needing oxygen under pressure. In order to allow this to be included in the United States Navy manual, it has been designated US Navy treatment table 9 and is commenced at 14 meters for 90 minutes with air brakes. It constitutes a convenience table and by that is meant that divers that are initially treated on another table, usually a treatment table 6, may, if they need additional treatments, often be added to the regular patient load of hyperbaric treatments and therefore simply ride the bus with them, undergoing a standard hyperbaric oxygen table as a follow-on treatment for any residual or remaining symptoms of decompression illness. Note again, this is not an initial treatment and the treatment is approximately two hours. 
The indication is only for minor residual symptoms and there is an encouragement to slow the ascent to a slower rate than would usually be used in a clinical hyperbaric oxygen uh, situation. Therefore, typically between 15 and 30 minutes ascent rather than the most common 5 or 8 minutes that would be used for a regular uh, patient treatment. This is what the table looks like, 2.4 atmospheres for 90 minutes with two air breaks after the breathing periods of 30 minutes. There are a variety of other specialized tables that can make provision for deep dives, saturation dives and even situations where there is no oxygen to provide during recompression. These tables would not be used routinely and one needs to refer to the respective manuals in order to decide how these treatment tables might be applied. But they are given here for reference purposes. As can be seen, some of these tables have indefinite treatment periods and therefore constitute saturation tables. For the most part, many of these tables run into several days and should not be undertaken outside of highly specialized, dedicated facilities with experienced staff and medical support. This flow diagram represents a composite of a variety of dive tables that offer escape routes after increasing amounts of time at respective depths. In other words, as one enters the column on the y-axis, anywhere between 10 and 50 meters or even greater, the lines that make their way back to the surface represent the last boundaries for return to the surface on a particular table, with the outer margin being saturation decompression. In other words, the last line that ascends from depth to the surface constitutes a saturation decompression. In other words, at that point, it doesn't matter how long the diver has been at depth, even if they have taken up the maximum amount of inert gas, this would be the way in which they could be removed from pressure uh, without precipitating additional bubble formation. This is simply used as a guideline. If an actual table were to be selected based on this flow diagram, one should consult the original manual in which the table is published. As we've stated previously, one should avoid situations in which tables greater than 18 meters would be employed unless it is in a highly specialized environment with highly specialized staff under exceptional conditions in which it is deemed to be of absolute benefit to the diver to do so. The last aspect of managing decompression involves the critical treatment decisions that need to be made. Now US Navy Treatment Table 6 is the most common table in use and therefore I have developed this slide as a prompt for various critical therapeutic or operational decisions to allow someone who has perhaps a relatively limited experience in treating divers under pressure to get a fast ramp up on the critical points during the treatment. The first critical decision point is after 20 minutes at 18 meters after which one needs to decide whether the symptoms are static, improving or deteriorating. If they are improving, one can simply continue with a regular treatment table 6. If they are deteriorating, one has to decide whether one will extend the table or, in exceptional situations, whether one should move to a deeper treatment level. This should not be undertaken without expert input and an appropriate treatment facility able to do so. The next critical decision is made at the commencement of the third oxygen breathing period in which the decision should be made whether or not the table should be extended. In general, extensions are only recommended for neurological decompression illness. In other words, if a diver has a pure joint pain related form of decompression illness, it usually is a better return on investment to provide repetitive long oxygen tables rather than a single extended version of the table. However, if there are significant neurological conditions and those are related to bubbles, then extending the table is recommended. And this may be undertaken at 18 meters by extending the table twice for 20 minutes 
and at 9 meters by two extensions of 60 minutes oxygen. The extended version of the table is therefore 8 hours and 10 minutes. The next prompt, number 3, is during the ascent from 18 to 9 meters. The reason for this prompt is that this is the time in which a potential pneumothorax might manifest because the decompression causes it to expand and might even lead to a tension pneumothorax. Therefore, this is the time to monitor for deterioration of either decompression symptoms or respiratory symptoms. If they occur, the table may need to be extended at 18 meters and a pneumothorax may need to be treated. Once one has arrived at 9 meters, that is the point to consider what the chamber attendant's oxygen breathing requirements would be in order to prevent them from developing decompression illness. The reason for making this prompt here is because at altitude this may already be the point where the attendant needs to start breathing oxygen and therefore it's the appropriate time to consider whether or not the attendant should start breathing oxygen then. At the end of the second oxygen breathing period at 9 meters one can again decide whether or not extensions are required. Finally Upon the final decompression to the surface, one would again look out for a pneumothorax or the need for further extensions. And upon arrival at the surface, the decision needs to be made whether all symptoms have cleared and whether a repetitive treatment needs to be provided. Just reminding you about oxygen toxicity, that the maximum dose of recompression that can be provided would be two back-to-back -back unextended treatment table sixes. And therefore, if it is found that upon arrival at the surface, a diver still has serious or significant or deteriorating decompression illness, it is possible to immediately recommence another treatment table 6. In practice, however, both for the sake of logistics and staff and maybe compressing air banks again, it is quite typical to delay the further treatment uh, for 4 to 6 hours and then have a fresh crew to commence the second treatment. In summary, the first decision is whether or not a diver has decompression illness. If so, they are compressed to 18 meters on oxygen and after 20 minutes a decision is made whether it's better, the same or potentially worse. If worse, consult someone able to advise you. If it's improving or the symptoms are static, the decision is made to evaluate at the entry of the third oxygen breathing period and if symptoms are still present and significant, particularly if neurological, extensions may be provided. If symptoms have resolved or improved significantly at the time the third oxygen breathing period is commenced, then it is quite acceptable to continue an unextended treatment table 6. When in doubt, call Dan. Recompression is an exact art in terms of exact times and pressures, but it's a subtle science because in many ways the individual response to recompression has not fully been defined. Nevertheless, following a standard regimen of recompression affords the medical legal benefit of following a standardized treatment regimen. When in doubt, recompress, meaning if symptoms are significant and likely to be attributed to decompression illness, there is a certain sense of urgency and also justification to recompress. Follow recognized protocols to avoid medical legal pitfalls. We suggest that you get advice and help early rather than finding yourself trapped at 50 meters with a deteriorating diver. And in broad principles, don't decompress a deteriorating patient because it would exacerbate the symptoms. Don't decompress a convulsing patient because you may either cause or exacerbate a lung overpressure injury and gas embolism. And don't ignore minor symptoms or residual symptoms that seemingly have recovered spontaneously because they may subsequently worsen and usually at a more inconvenient time. Again, Consult Dan. Dan is your most important ally in addition to pressure, oxygen and time. Thank you.